Tina um, Tatakato. I'm feeling more relaxed now after the, those first two presentations because they really uh, provide a great platform for me for me to say what I want to say. Uh, and the fact that I that I agree agree with most of what they've said makes it easier too. So. Um, so this paper charts a middle course uh, between the old, basically, Pākehā orthodoxy that sovereignty was ceded by Māori in the treaty, making them individual citizens of an emergent colonial nation-state, and the newer orthodoxy that Māori never ceded sovereignty to the British Crown but retained it. Now, the big thing here is what sovereignty means, of course. <clears throat> Ironically, the basic error in both versions is that they ignore or downplay the Māori text. The old orthodoxy ignored it altogether by reading only the English version. The newer orthodoxy reads the Māori text, but downplays, even ignores, the giving up of kāwanatanga governorship, government, in Article 1. Now I say, and it's possibly a slightly provocative um, statement, that the fault they both share is a paradigm of sovereignty. Uh, the assumption that sovereignty is an abstract notion of power, in some versions absolute power, was the basic issue. So this paper charts a middle course between these two orthodoxies, old and new, by arguing that the main issue that the treaty was designed to remedy was the absence of a civil authority that could maintain public order amongst Pākehā settlers, but also across or between tribes uh, and between tribes and settlers. A very important idea accompanies this concept of civil government, however, uh, or kāwanatanga, that as exercised by the Queen's Governor, it was one that recognised other forms of customary authority and law, uh, namely chiefly authority over um, or vis-à-vis -vis tribes. As we've heard from Ned, uh, this is consistent with the real politic of empire in which the Crown necessarily worked with other local, mostly elite authorities. Uh, but is also consistent with a new humanitarian reading of empire in which British traditions of constitutional authority uh, and the rights and liberties of the subject should apply to native or indigenous subjects of empire equally. Uh, I wasn't going to reference it, but since it's been referenced, Te Iwi Tahi Tato, I think is that, that's some, one way of characterising uh, what that meant. Uh, so there's, there's an equality under legal protection, but that doesn't necessarily mean that, that the same laws or customs are being applied to the different populations. <clears throat> so my paper is firstly uh, concerned with exploring a cultural linguistic reading of what the Kāwanatanga in Article 1 meant, according to um, British political tradition. And in the second section of the paper, I consider what I suggest was an emergent hybrid political tradition during the 1830s to 1850s and beyond really, in which the dominant concepts were ideas of kāwanatanga, law or tūre, monarchy, and to some extent assemblies or waka meninga that would serve as a vehicle to decide law. So what I'm talking about here is that there was a developing or an evolving political discourse that to some extent was shared between Māori and British leaders, not always understood in exactly the same fashion, but it constituted or it shaped a new political or public sphere of authority, um, and which in a sense backgrounds the acceptance firstly of a British resident uh, and then the Queen's Governor. Uh, and I argue that this is supported by reading of both texts. Um, so what I want to do really is um, an exercise in a cultural history of politics, um, perhaps an ethnography of a political tradition, um, as it was reapplied to this new imperial indigenous order. And it's very high level, so specialists will probably be able to take me down on certain points, but um, I hope to sort of characterise what's going on. So civil government and British history, a pro political anthropology of the metropole. So in the translation of Article 1 by Reverend Henry Williams and his son Edward, who was essentially a native speaker, um, the concept of sovereignty was rendered as government, kawanatanga. And we've heard that the orthodoxy since Ruth Ross has seen this as a sign of subterfuge, 
as fudging the strong idea of sovereignty by turning it into a weaker idea of government. Now I'm arguing that this interpretation is misguided, uh, as revealed both by long-standing tradition and by the linguistic use of terms at the contemporary period, uh, government was the primary category of political thought in the English and probably British tradition. Uh, where the term sovereignty was used, it was often used alongside government or interchangeably with it. Uh, one feature of this interchangeability is the conflation of concepts of monarch or king and governor. So the 39 Articles of Anglican Doctrine from the 16th century stated that the sovereign exercised the chief government within the realm. Um, in 1840, um, a quarterly uh, review publication could still reiterate this conventional idea that the sovereign was governor of the country. I love Samuel Johnson's dictionary, so I like to quote it where I can. Um, the authoritative sort of English language dictionary of the day. And you can see here the sort of interplay of these, of these notions of sovereign, sovereignty, uh, which has a range of meanings actually, um, and, then, and then governor. Uh, one who has the supreme direction. This is a definition of governor. Um, and, and a reference to Psalm 22, one who is invested with supreme authority in a state. Um, now that interestingly is, is a reference to, uh, to verse 28 of that psalm. Uh, For the kingdom of the Lord is the Lord's, and he is the governor among the people. Therefore the Lord God, or Yahweh, is also identified as a governor in English vernacular translations of the Bible. Uh, and as a pointer to what I'm going to say a little bit uh, further on, uh, the, the translation of this psalm in Te Rawari, or the Māori prayer book, was... Uh, no Ihoa, the Lord, uh, to him belongs Te Ranga Tiratanga, uh, Ko Ia no Te Kawana i Wainganui o Ngā Iwi, he is the governor among the peoples. So this demonstrates, or one demonstration of the fact that these terms, kingdom, Ranga Tiratanga and governor, could easily be conflated in a Māori language translation. And, I, and I'll get to this a bit more. <coughs> so, I've done a quantitative analysis of 8,000 pages of leading periodicals uh, in parliamentary debates from the 1830s. Uh, this is actually a very tiny sample size, but I'm arguing it's a sort of representative, uh, representative sample. <clears throat> so what's fascinating here is that the term sovereignty hardly appears. Um, government is by, by, um, by far and away the most common term that you find. Followed, interestingly, by the Crown, the Constitution, uh, liberty or liberties, uh, and then you get things, things like kingdom, rights, sovereign, um, and then interesting words like privileges, charters, and so on. So when you combine this qualitative, oh, sorry, quantitative analysis with a sort of traditional intellectual history or history of political thought, um, this emphasises that the debate up about politics in the British tradition was often about uh, law and the constitution, the respective powers of the sovereign uh, and parliament, and the purpose and functions of government. Um, and so, and, and this had been the case for, for many, many centuries. Um, and into the 19th century, this was still the language. This is language from the 1830s. Uh, so what I'm really saying here is that this paradigm of government, kawanatanga, or civil government, um, helps us to understand why Williams could simply slot in kawanatanga for sovereignty in Article 1. Um, because a sovereign was a governor. Um, and so the sovereign's governor would do the same in the empire. This notion of civil government is uh, a really critical notion and Ned's referred to this in terms of its reference in the preamble to the treaty. Uh, this idea that, that civil government is the foundation of political society, um, characterised characterized by law and order enforced through, through public institutions. So we see this in the preamble in, in both texts. Um, 
and it points to the, the question, why did Queen Victoria wish to establish a sovereignty or a kawanatanga, or uh, seek, seek to establish sovereignty, it was to, in effect, establish civil government. Now, the, the form of civil government in British history or political philosophy was conventionally seen as a balance between monarchy, aristocracy, and democracy. Uh, that is king, lords, and commons. And the British sort of thought that they got that balance pretty nice, pretty, pretty well. Um, so in this political imaginary, the source of law was the king at court, surrounded by his councillors. In some versions, divine law or natural law was the ultimate source of law, I'd say probably in, in many versions. Um, decisions were made by the king, law was declared, but only on the advice of his councillors. And this morphed in time, of course, into the, the crown and parliament concept. Um, that the king is still figuratively in the parliament while law has been made, but of course he's not physically there. So that's part of the ongoing sort of mythos of the constitution. But we can't forget about what's going on in the rest of the realm. Um, so local authority also remained important in the English system. Uh, Local, locally, authority was exercised by aristocrats, gentry, local manorial courts, shire courts, and so on. And a lot could be said about that. <clears throat> These localities were uh, represented in the central parliament. Until well into the 19th century, it was aristocratic or landed classes, a small minority, that were represented. Although that representation began to change in the 1830s via the Great Reform Act, uh, which was being propelled by industrialisation, urbanisation, uh, the English system was still largely hierarchical, traditional and landed. So the Crown and Parliament remained in, at the centre, both symbolically and constitutionally. Um, so things like sovereignty of the people was a French idea. Uh, one that the British united against in defending the empire of liberty, as they saw it, against a, a mixture of anarchy, republicanism and Catholicism in the Napoleonic Wars. Um, and I should say, as not a complete aside, uh, wars in which treaty translator or interpreter Henry Williams fought uh, when he was in the Navy. So, so this old world system was still largely in place at 1840 when the Treaty of Waitangi was entered into. Aristocratic authority, or more broadly, the man of property, the gentleman, uh, compri comprise the ruling structure. And this is where I want to make some parallels here. So chiefs in New Tyranny were viewed by some Englishmen anyway as akin to gentlemen or the landed class. Uh, the role of leaders or groups of tribes was also appreciated, obviously. Uh, but there are parallels here back to Britain with the landed classes being still effectively community leaders through, through whakapapa, through customary status, and sometimes, believe it or not, through their achievements. Um, so, so this brief account of British political ordering of civil government um, helps us, I think, to reconcile Te Tiriti, the treaty. Um, Ned Fletcher has done ad admirably in describing the, the imperial context, but I think we also need this, this history of, of the domestic constitution to understand some of the parallels that were made in people's minds. Um, and so we've already heard about, you know, at the centre there is this idea of the kāwanatanga. Um, as I'm putting it here, in the localities there is rangatiratanga or landed gentry. Um, that rangatiratanga was also represented in the central kāwanatanga. And that sort of picture between centralised and localised authority, often tensions, should be said, between uh, imperial administrators and, and local indigenous authorities uh, they, that played out in the empire. <clears throat> so, I now want to turn to something I'm calling civil government in New Tyranny, New Zealand, a political anthropology of the emerging hybrid imperial order, or really imperial indigenous order. So, so these parallels that I've been discussing invite an extension of um, this type of political anthropology to the construction of this new 
uh, authority in New Zealand in the 1830s to 50s period. So Clifford Geertz, who is um, someone I also like to quote a lot, um, wrote an important article in the 1970s on the symbolics of power, specifically on the role of enchantment or charisma, uh, tradition or mystique in legitimising authority. This is what he said, thrones may, may, be, may be out of fashion and pageantry too. Uh, you might say that the recent funeral of Elizabeth II might disprove that statement. Um, but political authority still requires a cultural frame in which to define itself and advance its claims. And so does opposition to it. So this is kind of that public space in which these things are, are debated. A, a world wholly de demystified is a world wholly depoliticised. So how did this work in the evolving new tyranny, Aotearoa, of this period. I'm going to go back to, I guess, in a sense, where, where uh, Ngāti Kawa, well, he didn't start there because he started in, with Kupi, but um, I'm, going to, I'm going to sort of start with Te Pahi and people like that. So by the time the Treaty of Waitangi was entered into in 1840, northern tribes, and also we can't forget about other iwi that, that had had uh, considerable interaction with, with the Europeans by 1840, so Kaitahu and other coastal iwi. Uh, so I think there's evidence that they've been discussing European ideas of authority for some two generations, say. So Māori had been board, boarding whaling and sealing vessels. They travelled all the way to London. Some had travelled with missionaries, seen the monarch, um, notably Hongi Hika and Waikato with Thomas Kendall. And engagements with um, Australian governors dated from Tapahi's visit in 1805-06. And the frequency of these visits um, increased once Samuel Marsden began purposefully hosting visiting chiefs uh, in New South Wales. And Marsden liked to have all sorts of different conversations uh, with Rangatira, um, as this quote sort of suggests, uh, including around what this notion of government or European um, notions of it were. And he famously proposed uh, to Hongi Kika that he might become a king of New Zealand, uh, which Hongi dismissed. Um, I think he said, or it's recorded, he said, um, I only, they only really listened to me during war um, and not at other times, which I kind of would, would doubt. I'm sure some people listened to him um, most of the time. Um, but. Marsden, in effect, introduced this concept of civil society or government uh, in these discussions. And in particular, the idea that although the British monarch governed the whole island, uh, he was also subject to law himself, or herself. Uh, and, and in particular, the task of adjudicating on crime rested with a jury, as Marsden put it, of 12 gentlemen. <coughs> so, these ideas of rule by kings and governors, assisted by juries, they became, I'm suggesting, part of the political lexicon, the, the language of at least Northern Iwi by 1840, uh, and probably via trade and other uh, Iwi networks, um, other rangatira and hapu. I think when you look, it's interesting when you look at, um, at the pattern of tre treaty signings uh, through the country, or at least at some key people who didn't sign the treaty, and the and the reasons why they what which they gave for this, um, or that we can suppose that they they gave. Uh, for example, to Hugh Hugh Mananui Ngati Tuifari Toa, although he'd had limited personal contact with Europeans by 1840, uh, I interpret it anyway that he must in effect have understood that that the treaty proposed that his chiefly authority was in some way to become subject to Queen Victoria. Um, and he refused to sign. Um, Portito Te Whero Whero didn't sign, um, and other leading chiefs of Waikato Tainui as well. Of course, um, Ngāpui did sign, uh, or most, uh, most Ngāpui and, and other, other areas. Um, so, yeah, we had this discussion therefore over what is the notion or what is the role that this governor is going to play in this new order. Um, to what extent he, is, he will be up high. Um, now, <clears throat> I suggest that 
what this sort of this metaphor of up high down low was mostly about is that chiefs were kind of testing the proposition um, like would would their role would their authority still be protected in this new this new order would their lands would their customs be preserved um, so but I don't think in a sense there's there's a doubt that the governor would be up high however you understand that um, Wakanene, of course, invited the governor to be a father, a judge, and a peacemaker. That's at least the English version of his kōrero, um, panakariyo. And I won't, I won't dwell on all of these things, but use the metaphor of the shadow of the land, which uh, to me, I guess, speaks of a protection-type concept. Um, and by this, by this protection, tribal control over whenua, kāinga, and resources would be guaranteed. I think that was Panakario's hope, at least, in uh, 40, and I suggest um, the hope of those promoting the treaty, uh, missionaries and Captain Hobson included. But there were some other uh, features of this, um, this emerging hybrid discourse. Uh, and I think the, the notion of 2D or law is, is a really significant one. So it was prominent in the 1835 declaration where the assembly of Rangatira were to, and we've already heard this today, meet annually to make laws or tūre for the dispensation of justice, preservation of peace and good order, and the regulation of trade. And they reserved, they reserved these powers of lawmaking and kāwanatanga uh, to themselves exclusively in their collective capacity. Um, now in the treaty text, uh, we, we see this reference to Māori and Pākehā are still living in a state of lawlessness. Um, and the, it's interesting that the articles of the treaty themselves are referred to as Tūri, uh, the three articles. So, and in Article 1 we get this, uh, we get this reference to Kāwanatanga uh, being, being tukud or ceded uh, through the territories of the tribes. So what was this notion of, um, of law or Tūri? Uh, it was actually adapted by the missionaries at Tahiti from the Hebrew Torah. Uh, so it wasn't a, um, a native word. Um, so this, um, this new language of law along with governorship, uh, kingship, sorry, stay there, um, was uh, comprised in the text of um, morning and evening prayer. Um, including the Psalms and in um, various scriptural narratives and stories. Uh, 2D mostly stood for God's law uh, in these texts. Uh, for example, in the service of evening prayer, uh, used almost every day on the mission stations, God was referred to, uh, and this is where we get these other bits and pieces of language coming through, the, the governor of princes, Te Kawana Inga Pireniha, as well as te kingi o ngā kingi, te ariki o ngā ariki. So in this one prayer, God is referred to again as kāwana, kingi and ariki. Um, and it's important to underline that these were prayers being prayed uh, essentially every day. Um, and so these, these concepts were, were being sort of interwoven through these prayers. And I think it's also important to note how, at least in the north, uh, how widespread the use of these prayer services were by the by the 1840, uh, and, and, and certainly by the early 1840s in, in other parts of the country. Um, for example, uh, between 1839 and 1842, uh, William Colenso printed 47,000 uh, copies of the small prayer book, which was essentially the morning prayer and evening prayer at the Paihia Mission Press, and these were distributed around the country. Um, around 5,000 copies of the complete Psalms, uh, with many references to the law of God and the story of Israel, were printed in the same period and distributed. Just to complete my, my statistics here, um, by the mid-1840s, CMS numbers alone put Māori attending regular uh, services at around 35,000 people. Now that's a best guesstimate. Um, the Māori population at the time in 1840 is anywhere between, um, I think, um, 
70,000 to 90,000. So when you consider like um, the numbers of texts in circulation uh, and compared with the population size and also the regularity of services, uh, including these, these press services, um, I think this is a significant phenomenon. So we also get, of course, the New Testament story and other scriptural stories about people such as Pontius Pilate, uh, the Roman governor, his role in condemning Christ to the cross. Um, all those sorts of stories which sort of fill out a picture of what uh, governors were. Um, clearly, uh, Governor Pilate had power over civil life and death, although the Jewish leaders played an important role in that process. So uh, I think it's been, the parallel's been draw, drawn before too between uh, the governor, um, Pilate Hobson, uh, and the Jewish leaders as a kintarangatira perhaps. Um, I don't think I thought of that first. Um, so this notion of law I think is, is very significant and also these new forms of legal process um, the, the practice of subjecting crimes to a trial by jury uh, had already, forms of jury trial had already begun to be conducted on mission stations before 1840. So to summarise the picture to date, um, the symbols of this new post-1840 political order were monarch, or British monarch, governor and tūre. But there were there was another trio of political powers and institutions. First, rangatira, or tribes. They would retain control of tribal estates, villages, other uh, taonga. Uh, second, there was this inchoate idea um, that the governor would continue to meet in assembly with chiefs uh, as he did at treaty signings and in the early years following Waitangi. Now, admittedly, this is only a suggestion, 1840. But again, the concept of assemblies to make laws uh, was or had become part of Ngāpui consciousness, at least through the text of Hewhakaputanga, uh, perhaps also exposure to the governor's councils in Australia uh, and the, also the British Parliament even. Um, so uh, in, the, in the late 1830s, uh, res responding with alarm to colonisation proposals, Henry Williams and other missionaries proposed to the CMS in England the idea that a British military force under a governor would support the law-making authority of such a chiefly authority, uh, which I guess was in line with the Declaration's annual Parliament of Chiefs uh, and perhaps Busby's more evolved protectorate proposal in 1837. But I guess my, my, um, my point here is that all such proposals were versions of this kind of supra-tribal political order or civil government and these, um, these ideas of assemblies had, an, had a long afterlife. Um, chiefs meeting with governors, usually informally, uh, but some were more uh, formal. Uh, and another, the last prong of this, the, this uh, I guess, trio of uh, institutions was the press uh, and the importance of um, writing and protest by writing um, and the printing press, uh, which Māori owned their own versions of by the 1860s. So, just to um, conclude, um, what did political authority in the colony from 1840 onwards look like? Um, the governor, I suggest, was the centre of this new order, representing the crown and the tūre, but alongside him or around about him were the rangatira, who legitimised his authority um, uh, to, a, to an extent, and they also, uh, in a sense, legitimised Pākehā settler authority, which you can see by this, the, the sort of um, gathering that even uh, New Zealand company settlements had with chiefs in the 1840s. So this was um, how things played out uh, in um, the 1840s and 50s, and Governor Gray was, of course, le very deft in and conciliating chiefly authority, um, often for his own ends. But uh, when 
the political centre of the colony, and I'll end on this point, when the political centre of the colony shifted from the governor to the settler parliament, uh, partially from the mid-1850s, uh, more substantively uh, by the mid-1860s, uh, this aristocratic or gentlemanly nexus dissolved uh, and the rangatira were pushed away from the centre of power into the outlands of authority. Um, however, um, meetings like this still occurred, significant meetings into the 1890s between the premiers and Kotei Tanga Parliament and so on. Uh, but things had certainly changed by the mid-1850s. Mid and that's my last slide. Comparing the treaty to the Magna Carta. <laughs>